Okay, so let's let's pick it up, you guys. Let's keep talking about um, successes, conservation successes, and uh, and I want to talk about um, a success that's right underneath our nose. So um, now we talked about the Endangered Species Act. You guys have read about the Endangered Species Act, <clears throat> and we and you all typically view uh, species-based management through an endangered species lens. I, I, I think it's fair to say, right? That's how you guys think about stuff. You think about, oh my gosh, this tiger or this mountain lion or whatever is endangered, so we need to work on endangerment. So the story with California tule elk is interesting in that it is absolutely a conservation success story, um, but it's taken place 100% outside of the Endangered Species Act. And indeed, it was specifically not uh, 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 added into the Endangered Species Act when we had both the California version or the, the uh, federal version. And so this is an alternative pathway that we can use um, governmental policies and, and efforts, but um, don't go down the, the ESA pathway. So um, we have, of, of the surviving big things that walk around the surface of the state of California um, that are still here, we have deer, we have elk, we have pronghorn, and we have mountain sheep. Those are our last big, large megafauna grazers. Um, and uh, an elk is, a, is the guy we want to talk about today. So we have three different elk in California. We have Thule elk and then uh, Roosevelt and Rocky Mountain elk that are basically um, subspecies of one another. So we have two, two species and, and three total, um, total elks or, or two species and two, uh, two subspecies if you prefer. Um, so these are large, these are large critters. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, I guess I'll have to see if I can get this to come over the speaker when we take a break. It sounds like this. It doesn't sound like a, like if you hadn't heard it before, you might not know it was a, an elk. Yeah. Although they're usually farther away, but yes, yes, it's true. Um, so now Thule elk of, of those three that exist in California, that uh, Thule elk is the smallest of the three. Nevertheless, it's still big, right? It's still about my shoulder height when I'm standing up. Uh, you know, um, big, huge, uh, large-bodied critter with a lot of momentum when the critter is moving around. Essentially, Thule elk is a big deer, right? A big, fat deer. Um, this is a critter that um, is a ruminant, right? So this is like our other ruminants. It's going to eat, a, needs to eat a lot of vegetation, needs to ingest a lot of plant matter, and then has a ruminant digestive tract where, where um, uh, plant matter is cycled around and has different uh, uh, chambers to deal with the breakdown of these hard to digest lignans and things of that nature. So um, basically, they just need to eat a lot. You eat a lot and you eat all the time. And so that, that grass and, and vegetation isn't necessarily high calories, so they need to eat a lot of it all the time to get enough to sustain themselves and do the reproduction and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the males are big, right? So the, the biggest males will be over my head. Um, and uh, about 350 to 450 in terms of uh, kilos. And they'll have these large, multi-pronged uh, antlers. The antlers grow uh, each year. So right about now, right about this time of year, we're starting to, they're starting to grow. And they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the whole growing season. And they're used uh, for, for defense, but they're primarily used in, in dominance displays um, with the bigger um, Antlers. I mean, they're all used for defense. They can all use for scraping things and stuff. But, but the biggest ones are used for um, uh, fighting for superiority um, and access to reproduction. Um, so it's basically uh, like some of the other uh, some of the other large mammals, like our um, uh, elephant seals. They have they're they're poly, polyan, they're, They have multiple females for one male. 
and they have a harem type of mating system where one male mates with a lot of uh, nearby females. Um, they're going to mate in the summer and then they're going to have um, a little bit shorter than a human gestation um, and then the babies are born about now and they typically have one baby per mom, one calf per cow. Um, they hang out you know, in and around near mom for uh, about uh, uh, two years or so and then can break off if, if they uh, want to. A typical tule elk is going to live a couple decades. So they're, they're relatively, they're not like you know, elephant ages, but still they're, they're pretty long-lived uh, critters. Large bodied, long live, eat a lot of food. That's what they look like, really cool critters. Anybody seen a tule elk? Just, uh, in California? Not in California. Oh, okay. So um, uh, at the end of this, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys where you can all go to see them um, with only about an, and only within about an hour drive from here. So it's, there's, we're really close by. Are they in the Bay Area? There, I know there's one elk grove, right? Yeah, we'll talk about them. There, there, there's there's uh, um, about 22 herds all over the state of California. So not so many in extreme Southern California, but certainly Central, Northern, the Sierras, yeah, so they're, they're all around. So this is not a Thule elk, but this is from uh, near where uh, 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 Professor O'Hyrick uh, uh, likes to go vacation. Um, and this is in Jackson Hole, and this is this famous elk antler arch. So again, these aren't Thule elks, but, but to give you a sense, um, when these guys shed, they drop you know, a lot of, in, in elk, country when there's a lot of elk and they're dropping a lot of antlers there's there's a lot of there can be a lot of antlers around okay so this is an iconic part of these guys and so let's do a little quick quiz so uh again uh we're not having a quiz today we'll have a quiz uh next class but if you guys get this right 100 percent on the next quiz so uh everybody uh so here you go so a b c a through h and you need to uh, guess which one. So we'll take just a quick two minutes here and, and make your stabs as to what you think is what. Okay, here we go. Let's see, let's see if you guys get it right. Ready, steady, drum roll. Ah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so H-E-B-F-G-C-D-A. Anybody get them all right? Really? H-E-B-F-G-C-D-A. Oh, snap. All right, cool. Anybody else get it all right? I don't know. Okay, uh, well, good try. Good try. All right, cool. Uh, so you mean two then? You mean, like you, flipped, you mean one pair? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, cool. All right, so, um, so uh, okay, so we have... Uh, H is uh, mountain goat. E is bighorn sheep. Hopefully, everybody got the bighorn sheep. Uh, hopefully, that one that one should be uh, uh, good. Um, okay, so so for example, bighorn sheep have horns as they're as they're known, um, and so horns are permanent. They're not shed. They have these year round. They they have them all the time, I should say, and they're bone in the middle, and they have a keratin sheath. So keratin, like your kind of fingernails, kind of a, a sheath uh, covering, covering that. And they grow, and they get bigger uh, over, over time, and they curly cue. Um, they're not forked. Horns are never forked. That's what a horn is, right? So like think of a rhino horn, right? It's, we call that a horn. It's just like a one, one stab thing, right? So just like this, this E right here, this, this curly Q, it's actually, it, it's curves, but it's one thing. Okay. Uh, the other, uh, another uh, strange one is the pronghorn, right? So the pronghorn is number D right here. So note here that this guy is forked, but just a little bit of forked. Um, and uh, pronghorns have a bony core uh, with a keratin sheath, but that, they shed that annually. So it's kind of like a horn, but that comes off uh, uh, all the time. Um, uh, and both sexes uh, in the, ran in the uh, horns and in the pronghorns have, have, uh, have these structures on their heads. Then the other guys are antlers. So antlers 
are uh, males have them and they're shed annually. And so they have this, uh, uh, they have a little bit of what's called felt uh, over it, which helps these uh, antlers grow. Um, and they're basically bone. Um, and so, so for our uh, elk, our, our, our Thule elk and the, okay, so the other one I hope you guys got. So I hope everybody got the, um, the sheep right here and I hope everybody got the big moose, right? So we don't have any moose in California, but we do in North America. And, and, and those, are, those are pretty different, right? Very, pretty different looking. Um, and the pronghorn actually has this weird little thing, but, but the rest are, are, are fairly similar, these, these antlers. So let's talk about what we have. So here are the elk in uh, northern, or here are the elk in North America, I should say. Okay, here's the, here are the distribution of elk across North America. So this is, um, you know, historic in, in their range. And so, you know, uh, broadly speaking, we had elk over most of the U.S., with the exception of the sort of extreme eastern seaboard and the south, the Gulf South. Um, and uh, not, a, not a huge amount in the desert, dry areas of the Intermountain West. But pretty much the rest of that, uh, the core of North America had a lot of elk back in the day. This is where we were as of um, about 40 years or so ago. And so uh, the orange splotches here represent where we have uh, one or more elk species. And you'll notice in California, we, we have a few, um, but not, not so much. Uh, really, elk are concentrated in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so this is what we believe, our best guess, this is, this is sort of the historic elk distribution in California. So the uh, Roosevelt elk are, were more up, like, trending on into Oregon. And the core of Thule elk were in the Central Valley and the coast ranges um, uh, just barely down to us. So we, we, we clearly had elk, but the elk were basically in what we would now call Los Padres and, and that sort of chunk of the county. Um, but definitely coastal California had a lot of elk. Definitely uh, the, the Central Valley had a lot of elk. And they were quite common. By 1870, they were basically all gone, right? So, and, and most of this eradication had happened in the preceding couple decades. This was a very, we've seen this before, right? Rapid over-exploitation or, or intense exploitation to the point where it becomes over-exploitation and then we rapidly drive the population um, down. And remember, how many babies does the mom typically have a year? One, right? So if everything goes super, super well and you find a mate and this and that, you're maybe making one baby a year, right? Not like a rabbit or a rat or some of these, um, you know, high R selected species. These are slow growing critters. And so, as we know from our previous discussions, we know they're more vulnerable than um, some of these fast growing populations. So by, by 1870, we're basically down to a little pocket in the extreme northwestern part of the state for the Roosevelt elk, and then down to Button Willow. That's still where you can see them today. So if you want to see, um, guaranteed to see Thule elk, um, go to see the Button Willow herd right there at the base of the grapevine um, at the start of uh, uh, like, uh, just, just the very bottom, the, the northern edge of the grapevine. Um, uh, if you're on the five freeway. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about how we got to just w what happened to them and, and why we know they were just in one little spot. So, the, so that, that's not a circle distribution, that's literally one ranch. So everybody was down to one small um, penned in group and that was it, all that was left on the planet. Um, uh, about 2000, this is where we are, right? So I mentioned this is a conservation success story. So we've gone from that one, if we talk about, we're talking about Thule elk here, um, that one little teeny tiny population to, to all this red, right? And so we've, we've done a, a pretty good job um, within about 100 years of, of getting these guys back. We can still do better, by all means. I'm not saying it's done. I'm not saying we, we, we've quote unquote saved them, but we're, we're doing a lot better, yeah. Someone's ship went out to the island, that wide island? Yes. 
So the one on the islands were, were actively introduced, right? And so that they were on our island. They were on Santa Rosa Island. So they were introduced for hunting operations. So they were, they're, they were not indigenous out there. They're not native out there. Um, but absolutely they were out there. Yep, yep. Not, not anymore. We've removed them, right? Um, with the, the full conversion of the Vale and Vickers um, hunting operation um, to complete conversion to the National Park Service, we've, we've removed the non-indigenous the non ungulates from there. So, so this is what it was in 2000. There's no longer a red dot on Santa Rosa Island right now. But as of 2000, that, that, that there were. Um, and uh, this is, looks pretty much about the same as it was in, in 2017. This is the most recent series of maps came out uh, about uh, uh, late, late uh, 20-teens. And so, so basically this map is pretty similar. Okay, so let's talk about, let's, so, so that, that's kind of how they, they shrunk. Let's talk about, or, or, or excuse me, where they were in space. Let's talk about how they shrunk. So uh, this all starts with so many of our conservation challenges in California with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill and the massive influx of European colonists um, and, uh, and, and gold seekers uh, in the wake of that discovery of gold in Sutter's Mill. So everybody should be able to remember that date because everybody can remember the San Francisco 49ers, right? So we call those guys the 49ers because they discover gold in 48 and they, the word spreads and the next year is when everybody comes, start, starts coming, right? So uh, about 1847, um, California, about 14,000-ish folks, right? Um, something on that order of magnitude. Um, by 1849, 93,000. By 1852, a quarter of a million, right? So a massive explosion, orders of magnitude, uh, more people here. As those people come in, as we've talked about, we talked a little bit about this in the context of grasslands, but as those people come in, they want, they, they need stuff, right? They need stuff. And so um, they start hunting everything because they want to eat and tule elk are big and don't move very fast, so they're an easy target. Then when we start to bring in livestock to provide uh, food and, and milk and things of that nature, um, that now they're going to compete with, now the Tule Elk have another competitor on their hands, right? Um, we see the conversion, as we, again, as we've talked about with the grasslands, we see the conversion of our perennial dominated and, and small annual native dominated grasslands and forblands um, get converted to what we have start the process to what we have now, which is the sea of invaders, the sea of Eurasian grasses uh, that are mostly annual, um, that, that clog and, and dominate and have changed the ecology of our California grasslands. Then the other, so as that's all going on, then we start converting huge swaths of the Central Valley into larger scale ranching and farming. And that was their core territory. And so, uh, so that starts to hurt them as well. And then we have that big drought that we mentioned before um, in the, starting the 1860s that really, that really whacks them and makes it hard for everybody. So again, this is what we think, sort of a cartoon, cartoon kind of picture, right, is that we had this big central uh, coastal and then central inland distribution of elk, and it starts to get you know, you know, petered out. And then by the 1860s, they're pretty much um, reduced and they're they're gone, and then today we've reintroduced them, but but um, we drop down to this very very small population of tule elk. Here are best estimates of numbers. So around 1,500 were were historic ecologists have estimated there was probably about half a million tule elk in California. Um, some of the first uh, Spanish. Uh, missionaries and, and uh, imperial powers and all that uh, uh, document Tule Elk and their re regular occurrence in their journals, so we know that they were here, fairly common. The very first California game law that goes into effect in 1852 uh, specifically protects elk and other species um, for six months out of the year in the 12 counties where they um, where they uh, 
existed at the time. So this is for, this is essentially the first stab at a hunting season, right? So hey, this is the time you can hunt, this is the time you can't hunt these critters. So we, this idea of trying to modulate our exploitation pressure. Um, however, this is what we would also call an unfunded mandate, right? So it comes from the legislature, but there's no money to enforce this or whatever, so it's up to the local sheriff, the local authorities to actually enforce that, and nobody really enforces anything back then related to this. Two years later, uh, the thought is we need to expand this to the entirety of the state, so now, now it applies to not just those 12 counties, but all of the state. Um, and then, uh, so, okay, so then 1870, we have somewhere between, uh, you know, two and a couple dozen elk in all of California. So we've gone from half a million to a handful. And as a pattern that we've seen repeated elsewhere, once all of a sudden there's nothing, then it is, oh, then we better do something, right? Now, now, now that we've driven the numbers super, super low, oh, we better have some drastic action. We've talked about this with oak trees and various things. Um, and so, so in 1873, we make a law that says hunting tule elk is a felony, not just a misdemeanor, which is what a lot of the hunting rules are, but an actual penalty, pen, fen, <laughs> penalty, an actual felony, which is a real penalty and publish, punishable by up to two years in prison. By 1874, the lore, the lore, and you'll hear this repeated a lot, the lore is that we're down to, quote unquote, two tule elk, one male, one female, on this guy named Henry Miller's ranch. And this is in Kern County. Um, and uh, he basically said, he was a hunter, he hunted tule elk, and then he saw their populations uh, crash, disappear, and he got really, really sad and said, this is, this is messed up, right? Just like the people that hunted passenger pigeons, just like the people that, that engaged in all these, uh, you know, harvested all these very abundant organisms in their youth or, or earlier in their life, and then all of a sudden they, they, they suddenly are shocked the way, this is, this, is, this is the kind of shock that you guys feel about climate change, right? You're all of a sudden like, I can't believe it. Like, how do we get here? What, how can we, like, what, how do we do? And so this guy said, well, what I can do is grab a couple of these critters and bring them into, into my protection, basically, so nobody can shoot these last couple. And so he does that. And, and he grabs them, and he puts them on his farm, and, um, and the lore is that he saved, again, like the Adam and the Eve, right, the, the last male and female. Recent studies, uh, recent genetic studies, looking at the diversity, definitely show an absolute genetic bottleneck, major, major conservation challenge with the species. Um, you know, going from a half million individuals to just a handful is going to, we're going to lose a lot of our genetic heritage. Um, but it, the numbers are probably weren't, weren't, I mean, they're very close to two, but not exactly. The, the model suggests somewhere between six and 12 individuals were probably saved on his farm. So still very few, but, but not just an Adam and not just an Eve. Um, okay. Uh, we have what's called a, f yeah. How does the state not have problems with inbreeding like the mountain lion that we're seeing here, but then so little left? So the question is, hey, so uh, we're down to just two individuals. How do we not have problems? And we do. We do. So, uh, so the question is, uh, are the problems, you know, lethal to the species or not? And only time will tell, right? So as the population is growing, new mutations are entering, right? So the longer we get away from that bottleneck, the diversity is actually growing, right? Um, so we see this with elephant seals that also have a very, very, that were very, very abundant, crashed down to very few, and then have massively expanded, essentially back, in the case of elephant seals, back to their, uh, uh, and in fact, they probably exceed now their pre-exploitation population size. So numerically, they're doing great. Uh, uh, genetically, they're, they're, it's, it's still as if they're a much smaller population. But over the decades, since we've been um, protecting elephant seals, we've seen the diversity begin to grow. And so the same with these tule elks. But, 
but, but th there are still problems. There are still problems. And so the answer is how, how are they able to survive? They're able to survive because of the basic biology of reproduction. Um, and, and we just hope that the random chance of those deleterious mutations aren't, you know, aren't um, homozygous, you know, dominant kind of thing or, or whatever, or that we don't have a disease or some other stressor that comes in that we needed that other genetic uh, recipe that we don't have anymore in the, in the cookbook kind of thing. But yeah, so, but, but they're here, right? So, so they, they can persist. Um, so in 1878, we had, we had what's, what was called a fish commission that was, that would, that was, trying to better manage and steward our fish populations. That's expanded and we add what's known as game. So game is wildlife that we shoot, that we hunt. So game is exploited wildlife, right? And typically this means vertebrates and typically this means mammals, but it can also mean birds. Okay, by the early 1800s, these, these individuals that we had on this farm are starting to get like they're reproducing, they're, they're having babies, and they're starting to outstrip, they're sh starting to outstrip what, what uh, these guys can do in this little small farm, right? It's not a small farm, but still, it's a, it's a, it's a ranch, but it's, it's not infinite, right? So they're causing problems. So the first attempt, uh, the U.S. Biological Survey, so the, the feds, the federal uh, biologists, basically, um, say, hey, we're going to relocate some of these elk. And so they came in, and they tried to use the techniques that they knew at the time, which were for cattle, sheep, things of that nature. So typical ranching approaches where you, you, you go up to them, you throw a, a lasso around their neck, and then you, you bring them down, you knock them down, you tie their legs together. Didn't work. They, they, they're not a domesticated um, uh, type of, uh, of ungulate, and they're harder to put the lasso around their antlers, and it didn't go well, and they killed a bunch of them, right? The ones they tried to capture, they, they killed a bunch of them. They're like, oh, wow, this isn't really working. So they had to um, begin to do some elk-specific management. And so the generic things we thought we could port in from other experiences didn't seem to work, so we needed a new strategy. Um, and so one of the ideas, and, and this was expensive, right? This was expensive. So th then we begin to introduce this, uh, uh, the first hunting licenses in California. And so the idea there is maybe we can generate some money to help with things like the conservation of tule elk and other critters um, by using uh, people's interest in hunting, right? So how many people here uh, are hunters? How many people here have, have, have hunted animals? Just one. Okay, so you guys are you guys are typical of the U.S. So we are we are losing our hunters. How about fish? How many people fish? So slightly more. One, two, two people, two people fish here. So um, so if, you know if I if I'd asked this question 40 years ago, many more people would have their hands up. If I asked this question 60 years ago, probably almost all of you would have had your hands up that at least fished or or what have you, right? Um, and so this is. I'll say this very explicitly. This is a problem. This is a huge problem. So I think in our circles, we often think of hunting as a bad thing, right? I do not think that's supported by facts whatsoever. So trophy hunting, uh, uh, sort of slaughter hunting, like we saw with passenger pigeons, with, with the bison, et cetera, um, people going and blowing away a, a whatever, a rhino because they want its tusk or, or they want some medicinal properties, magical medicinal properties they think exist from its tusk or something like that. That's a problem. But generic hunting um, is not a problem. Hunting and fishing is not a problem. Indeed, those, those folks are the historic core of the conservation movement. And we would not have the conservation movement were it not for hunters and fishers. So, um, and so I'm going to show you some data here that, that suggests that without hunters, we wouldn't have had, um, well, 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 the pathway we chose um, uh, was deeply utilizing hunting and, and hunters. So, okay, so by 1914, these elk are still causing damage, 
And they're like, people are like, man, we got to do something, man. We, th these guys are just, they're, they're too big. And again, remember, these are big animals, right? These are 700 pound, big, tall things that are strong. And when they want to move somewhere, they move somewhere, right? And uh, they're not easy to sort of to keep contained. So we, they, they uh, reach out to the California Academy of Sciences, which is in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. And they say, hey, can you guys help us? And so they try another effort at relocating a subset of these elk. And it goes, uh, they still lose a lot, but it goes better. And they actually are able to relocate some. And then they learn a little bit. And then they, they start trying some other things and they see what works and what doesn't work. So over the next 20 years, they end up relocating a total of about 235 elk to 22 different populations, 22, 22 different locations around uh, California, most of which don't take. I mean, they might, they might get the, the tule elk there, but they don't establish a viable population that's growing and, and expanding. Um, at this time, we established the Cache, Cache Creek and the Owens Valley population, which have now become two of the most important source populations for the recovery of the species. Um, and, uh, and in 1930, we moved those elk from the, that ranch to this refuge at uh, Tupman. And uh, we establish the, uh, in 1934, we established by law the, Cal the Tule Elk State Reserve, right? So this is um, one of our first state reserves. And this is at Button Willow, and this is the one I mentioned you guys can go see today, right now, and you can see Tule Elk there 365 days of the year. And there's a, there's a viewing platform where if they're not right up next to where, where you're standing, you can still pretty much see them just about everywhere, um, unless they're sort of lying down sleeping kind of thing. Um, and it's great. It's a relative, so this state reserve is very small. It's a little bit less than four square kilometers, so it's pretty small. But uh, nevertheless, this is the sort of historic heart of, uh, of uh, Thule elk recovery. By 1940, we had three viable populations that were growing um, at Cache Creek, Owens, and Tupman. Um, by 1970, we had, th we had three herds with a total of about 500 animals. By 71, we enact a new law that says no hunting of tule elk um, until the population exceeds 2,000 individuals. So again, this is, this is also an approach we see mostly with the Endangered Species Act, but the idea is, hey, we're going to get above some critical population size. Once we've surpassed that crit critical population size, then we can relax some of our restrictions or allow people to do more traditional activities in and around the organism. In this case, it's hunting. So in addition to just saying you can't hunt until we have a, a larger population size, this also says that the state of California must, is required to relocate tule elk populations. So the idea is to try to establish multiple populations all over the place in case a disease breaks out or a wildfire or whatever the heck, that we have some redundancy here and so we have backup plans of something. So in other words, all of our eggs aren't in one or two or three baskets. We want them to be in multiple baskets. At that time in 1971, the Owens Valley population, which I mentioned is this sort of mother, mother source population, um, was, uh, was less than 500, was less than 490 individuals. Um, okay, so, uh, so you can see that was, that, was, that was the vast majority of the of the Thule elk um, at the time. Uh, in 1974, we take the first individuals and uh, let them go, right? So this is not in a, in a reserve. This is not in someone's game park or some of that nature. This is just turn them free and, and you guys roam wherever you guys want to roam. Um, and yeah, there you go. Um, 76. We have the first federal dollars coming into the state to help us with, with this relocation effort and all that, all that good stuff. We hit the 2,000 individual mark in 1987. And so that starts the process where we begin to allow hunters to start to, to re, 
re-hunt these individuals. And so that first year of hunting is in 1989. And so this is a little bit what that population looks like, right? So this is, this is uh, not a uh, note here. This is not, um, this is not evenly, spaced here, uh, evenly spaced values here, right? We're kind of skipping. There's a little bit of skipping here. But basically, you see the general trend, which is going upwards up until uh, uh, the uh, end of the last century. Today, we've reintroduced tule elk statewide. So we have tule elk in, in San Diego County. We have tule elk in, um, in, in Humboldt County. We have tule elk. We don't have them in the desert and in the, in the high um, Sierras, but pretty much geographically and not really so much in the middle of the Central Valley, but pretty much everywhere else we have tule elk. Um, I think we have more than 22 herds, but I was trying to confirm this before um, lecture. I couldn't, I couldn't find that. So this is an old number. But I, I think we have more than 22 herds, but I, I couldn't confirm that. Oh, this is wrong. This number. So we have about 6,000 individuals statewide right now. Um, and we enter, we, we, we um, since the, and I'll show you some data in the next, but we, we issue regularly, uh, uh, we have tens of thousands of people applying for a hunting tag each year. Um, and we issue hundreds of tags each year. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Uh, this is just showing a little bit how we how we heard these guys. So uh, when we're ready to try to um, uh, bring some individuals to establish a new population, we use uh, helicopters to to um, uh, uh, so we put fences up. Then we have helicopters and we and we herd the elk with helicopters. They don't like helicopters, so they run away. And then we we sort of split them off and split them off and split them off into smaller and smaller groups. We um, uh, capture them, and then if they're a big male with a big giant antler on them, um, we will uh, anesthetize them and then cut off their antlers for transportation because that's safer for them and safer for everybody else. Again, they grow back in a year, remember? Um, and then uh, a veterinarian checks them out if they have sometimes uh, some of the genetic bottlenecking sometimes leads to some deformities with their uh, jaws and stuff. So we check to make sure that they uh, don't have any of those obvious problems take some uh, uh, blood samples, et cetera, and then we transport them via a truck to wherever the new um, uh, uh, colony is going to be. Uh, and one of these examples is, is Grizzly Island in the Delta area. So this is an area that is a diked wetland. So it's a relatively defined area. It's pretty big. We first introduced individuals in 1977 there. Um, and now it's become a, a, a major population. I don't have the most recent data, but, but it's probably over 200 and something now. I can't remember, 210, something like that. Okay, so let's look at the role of hunting and how this works. So here we go. So the, and, and so hunting is managed by these different uh, geographic regions. So it's not just hunting across the state. So again, if you recall, we're trying to have the population grow. So we use the money generated from the, the hunting tags, which we'll talk about in a second. And a tag is a opportunity to try to hunt a, an elk in this case, right? It's not a guarantee. It just says you have the opportunity to try to go do one. Um, and so, uh, so for this Grizzly uh, Island wildlife area, this is... Right, I mentioned before here that it was established in the late 70s. So this is about 20 years on. Um, for people that wanted to shoot one of these Grizzly Island uh, uh, tule elk, 2,000 people said they wanted to shoot one of these elk. Um, only two tags were issued. Um, and then two elk were killed. So if you have a tag, sometimes you can kill a critter and then that's success. Sometimes you, you miss or something doesn't work out or the weather's not right or whatever the heck it is. And so, so if you don't, the season, excuse me, the season ends and you haven't killed one, you're done, right? You have to reapply for another tag the next year. Um, and so in this case, since there's only two, two uh, uh, opportunities, um, in this case, every year from the late 90s to the early 2000s, um, every single tag was taken, but that, that doesn't always happen. We can also look at something like Fort Hunter Liggett up, by San, up in San Luis Obispo. And so, yeah? How come the tag issued is so low? 
Uh, be because for that particular population, the, 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 the population modeling was deemed that we could t only take a maximum of two to be safe because we want the population to keep growing. So, so each of these different hunting zones is going to have a different potential number of tule elk that can be taken. So we're managed on a sub-state basis. We're not managed on a statewide basis. So we're managed by these little populations. Uh, no. So we'll talk about that. So, 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 okay. So Caleb's question is, so this is different than, than, than people hunting out of state. This is total tags. So this is young people, old people, people from outside California can also apply to hunt. They pay a lot more, but they can also hunt. But it, it, it's just from the, from this conservation standpoint, it's just two individuals. That's it. Doesn't matter who the, 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 person pulling the trigger is. They could be a local, they could be from somewhere else in California, they could be from outside of California. Um, okay, so another quick example here, this would be Fort Hunter Liggett. Again, this is, this is a, a military uh, base up uh, San Luis Obispo area. And here we go. So here, um, now this one's a little bit funky in that um, this, is, this is on a, a military property, so, so um, it's not necessarily uh, free access all the time, like maybe some other areas. So in, in the mid-90s, we had a total of eight, a bit over 800 applications of civilians. The military have a reserve number of tags that they get to issue themselves internally, right? So, so they can only shoot, in, in 1986, they can only shoot a maximum of three elk, but they can, the military gets to decide how to do it. So that's an agreement the state has made, because this is federal land, right? This, this property is federal property. So three statewide issued hunting tags and three military. And in this year, only four total animals were killed. So it was only a, a, a you know, two out of three um, individuals were killed. Um, in other years, all six have been taken. As the population is growing, um, you know, right, we, can, we can allow more hunting. And then sometimes, uh, what do you think happened in 2001? Besides you guys being born. <laughs> Besides, you're trying to make me feel old, right? What else happened? 9-11, uh, no. right? So all of a sudden, everything got super locked down. So my restorations out at Magoo Lagoon, we used to go weekly check on them, couldn't go check on them. And when we would want to go, we'd have to get super special permission, and it would take like an extra hour at the security gate. We'd have to go with a military police escort, and it was just, it was just crazy. And so, and that was to go just check a salt marsh, right, to make sure things looked okay. This is, this is people walking around with rifles, right? So you can understand the military is like, yeah, no, we don't think we're going to do that this year. Okay, so here's, I just pulled this together uh, for the most recent uh, data. I just grabbed a little bit of sampling. And so now this is statewide. So this is combining stuff from all the different hunting areas. So in 2004, a total of, and now look at these numbers, 23,000 people applied for a hunting license. Now, how does this work? Excuse me, not a hunting license, a hunting tag. So how does this work? Let me explain. So to hunt, you have to have a, hunt, a hunting license. You have to first buy a, a, a generic hunting license, right? That gives you permission to hunt any of the, of the critters um, within the, the parameters, right? So we have what are called daily and sometimes seasonal limits. And there's certain, you know, in some cases with some species, you can only take males or, or, you know, or you can only take individuals of a certain size, all that kind of stuff. For individuals that are highly managed, we have this tag approach. So a tag is on top of your regular hunting license and you pay for this. And you pay a lot of money for this. And this is an opportunity. And this is a raffle, okay? Now, the way it works is there's, I mean, so they can happen different ways. So some states or some jurisdictions will do a completely, totally random raffle. So just like a bingo game, they'll, you know, you, you, you pay for a thing and you put a tag in there, right? And, you, and it goes in there and, and we, we shake the box and we pull out the number, right? The ran total random. In other cases, and we, this is the case in California, we have a point system. So with different things, you can get more points, which will increase your probability. But it is still a random draw. So you can try to give yourself some extra, extra. Um, it's like buying extra lottery tickets, right? You can try to give, give yourselves a higher chance, but it's still, it's still a, a random draw as to who actually ends up getting it. So in 2004, uh, uh, 
a little bit less than 23 and a half thousand people applied. We only had a total of 281 maximum potential tags issued. And so that translates into 83 people trying to hunt an, an elk for every possible tag, right? That's saying there's a lot of demand for, a lot of people want to hunt a tule elk. Well, I should say elk because this is, yeah, this, yeah, but well, yeah. So, so, so th this is, these, num these numbers for tule elk, but people are also, um, you, you can apply for Roosevelt elk too at the same time, but, but we're just talking about tule elk here. Um, that year, we end up killing a total of 191 elk, tule elk, and so that was a hunter success rate of about 68%. And you can look at how things have gone through. So here we go, 23,000, about 22,000, about 33,000, a little less than 40,000. And the la most recent year we have statistics, it takes, it takes the state about a year or so to compile all these numbers for us. So this is the most recent year I have right now. And that was 45, almost 45 and a half, more than 45 and a half thousand people said they wanted to shoot one of 284 tule elk. So it's gone up to, it's doubled from what it was 20 years ago. So now there's, there's about 160 people want to shoot an elk for every possible op opportunity to shoot an elk in the state of California. We harvested about the same number of elk as we did in 2009. So we're not uh, harvesting a, a large, uh, you know, massive number more of elk. Um, and the hunter success rate was about 73%. So the, the hunting success rate pretty much hovers between about, you know, two thirds and 70%, you know, sort of that, that, that's a pretty constant thing. And why is that? Well, that's because not everybody's a good shot. That's because some people haven't, haven't, don't have expertise in hunting elk because we don't hunt elk all that often, right? If we were in Alaska or Colorado, people would be much more proficient at hunting elk. Um, and, and just other vagaries of weather and things of that nature. Why maybe is it, I, I told you our population is growing. Why maybe is it that, okay, so the, okay, we could, took 191 or allowed 100, um, the model said we could maybe issue up to 191 kills and then 206, and then 215. But then now look, 2019 is 215. 2022 is 207. Why, why might the, the harvest number be going down here? Uh, so so one, one possibility is the population is, is, is not growing as fast. Yeah. Uh, good, good, um, good, I, good suggestion about the politics, or the, but, but that's not what's going on here. So what do we just theoretically get out of, at least get a little temporary pause on this last season? COVID. Oh, COVID, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> right, yes, I should, I, yes, I should have, I should have mentioned COVID, right. But, um, but uh, I don't think, I don't think COVID's going on here. <laughs> Drought, yes. So these individuals go out and graze a lot of forage, right? So, so their populations might be doing well, but we're worried about them, right? We're worried that their forage is getting scarcer and scarcer in this drought. So it's not necessarily the population has crashed, but we're worried about it crashing in the future. So maybe we're gonna be a little more conservative on the harvest rate, right? Which is what you wanna see, right? That's a responsible management program. We're not just saying every year is going up and up and up and every year it's some random number. It's like, hey, let's make an informed decision as to what is sustainable, what, what, what's the carrying capacity and all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, so you, there you heard a little bit of, of what they uh, sound like. Um, uh, and, and I guess the, in those recordings, the, the, rec the person doing the recording was pretty close. I'd say normally you hear them, they're, they're more of a distance and that, that sort of blowing through a tube sound um, is, doesn't carry as far as some other calls in my opinion. So it's, it's a, it tends to be a relatively light call, I think. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, where we are uh, currently with, with elk management. Um, we have uh, a special, uh, uh, again, tule elk is, is managed differently than most other 
critters. It, it has a special call out. Um, and up until we started the current uh, candidate listing for mountain lions in Southern California and coastal California, um, mountain lions also were an example of a species with a special management um, a call out. Uh, so anyway, so here we are. So, so um, it's managed by Section 1801 of the, of the State Wildlife Conservation Policy. And in particular, Section 3952 creates the state, California Statewide Elk Management Plan. And, uh, with, and the main nut of this plan is the state is charged with maintaining sufficient elk populations in perpetuity. So we want to have elk here always in the state of California. But then we have to do this stuff, right? And so as we mentioned, when we were talking about protected areas. Um, you know, this, this idea uh, is uh, you got to watch out for the kitchen sink, right? Everybody and their brother wants to put every consideration in there. So we have to maintain the populations in perpetuity, but also maintain the characteristics and geographic range of each subspecies. Uh, of, um, we have to consider the particular habitat conditions and trends. So some areas might be able to support more individuals, some areas not so many individuals, et cetera. We have to, we have to deal with factors impacting the elk. And primarily we're talking about conflicts with, with landowners. I'll tell you about some of my challenges I've had with them. Uh, and then um, management activities uh, to alleviate damage. That means damage to crops and human activities. Um, the state is supposed to identify high priority areas for elk management. Generally speaking, that means areas we want to introduce new populations into. Um, and, uh, and, const and, and be working on making sure we have the best possible estimate of minimum population viability or, or different population modeling efforts to keep the species around and, um, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of stuff. The main way we try to assure that we're doing a good job with our elks, as I mentioned, is to, is to move them, to relocate them from a relatively uh, growing population to either a place where there are no individuals or where the individuals are, are not reproducing, um, not in a growth uh, phase. Uh, so here are the crazy criteria, uh, which I would argue make sense theoretically, but in practice are, I would argue, overly constraining um, in my practical experience. But nevertheless, these, these are our current criteria. Number one, the new area must be free ranging. In other words, if you have a farm or a place that's fenced in, that doesn't count. Uh, you need to have a means to control the population size. We'll talk about that uh, next. Um, you have to have new areas. Uh, so so any, any of the new areas that we're going to put, put them to, have to have a, a minimum likelihood of human wildlife interactions, right? And as we know from our previous uh, things we've, we've looked at here, um, we humans are everywhere, right? And we're expand, we, our developments are ex continuing to expand into grasslands, into oak woodlands, into those places. So, so it's getting harder and harder to find a place where we aren't. And so anywhere where a human might be, there's the possibility of a conflict with a tule elk. Now, that's not necessarily, I mean, it could be being stomped on or gored, or, you know, getting an antler to the gut, right? So there's that. But it's also just, if, even if people aren't around, just with our infrastructure, these are very, very large animals, and they can wreak havoc on, on fences. They can wreak havoc on your sprinkler system, right? All that kind of stuff. And so all those things would, would qualify as a, as a, um, a, a significant conflict. Or I should say, at least potentially qualifies it. They are, they are a conflict, whether they're, they're deemed a significant conflict, that's another conversation, but, but the potential is there. Um, uh, disease, so this is a frequent red herring we've now come to understand, mostly from the livestock industry. So, um, so the argument has been, oh my God, we can't have tule elk in this area where we have cattle. Why? Because the tule elk might spread disease to my, to my heifers, right? 
What we know now is that almost never happens in terms of a wild population of bison or a, a cattle. It can, it absolutely theoretically can, but in practice it very rarely happens. What happens much more commonly is the domestic livestock spread disease to our wildlife. So the, the cattle spread disease to the bison, the cattle spread disease to the tule elk. So there is a worry about disease transfer, but historically that's been used to keep elk off of a landscape when in reality tule elk are potentially vulnerable to the existing uh, disease populations uh, uh, in those areas. Uh, the habitat must be suitable so we can't plop these guys down out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, right? That wouldn't work. Uh, we're supposed to avoid competition with other wildlife. I don't really know how you do that exactly because deer and other things graze and, and all this and that, but, but no, no direct competition. We wouldn't want to introduce a tule elk population where there's a Roosevelt elk population, for example. Should be within the historic range, which again is not that... That's, a, that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, we want to minimize the chance of hybridization with other of the oak species, or if we're talking about the subspecies, with those other subspecies. Um, uh, this shouldn't, their introduction shouldn't uh, uh, preclude public use of the land. So it's not like we're going to introduce tule elk and then nobody can ever go there anymore. Um, and then you know, and we're also supposed to be, in so doing, we're supposed to expand the population, uh, the numbers, total numbers of tule elk uh, going forward. So these all make sense, you know, at one level, theoretically, but altogether, they make it very challenging, right? Two or three of these would be, would be, okay, we could do that, but when we have, you know, 10, more than 10 of these things, it starts to become quite constraining. Um, most of the work that's done on here, uh, most of the, the conservation work is done in collaboration with um, different organizations that support elk conservation. Most of them are headquartered outside of the state of California, not all. Um, but uh, but there's, a, there's a large um, a collabor collaboration of folks that work on these uh, important individuals. And so this is, this is much more a researchery driven community than some of our other conservation populations that we try to manage. Um, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is basically the mothership of, of most elk conservation across the U.S. Um, and so this is, these are some of their pictures. Uh, and again, th these are the folks that sort of perfect, have helped perfect the, the um, herding with helicopters, et cetera. This guy's got a dart gun. He's trying to get an individual. He's, he's going to dart her, and then she'll fall asleep, and then she can either be translocated or she can be checked for health. Um, we do a lot with a lot of these larger animals, particularly animals that are having potential wildlife human conflicts. We do a lot of collaring, and we've seen that with our mountain lions, right? When we went up to see those guys, um, and the same idea, right? Where are they going? Where are they going to bump into people, or how frequently? So, right, if you if you hear our news reports from our mountain lions, oh my God, the mountain lions all around here, right? They rarely see them, right? So most of the time, the critters are there that that you know, don't incur the wrath of people or don't cause a problem. And so we need that spatial ecology data. We need that movement data to really understand that. And then are they spending most of the wet season in this area? Are they spending most of the dry season in this area? All that kind of stuff is really uh, greatly uh, aided by uh, tracking studies. Historically, um, as we've heard before, historically this has mostly been done with radio transmitter, beep, 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 and then triangulation with folks like you guys, undergrads, going out for hours and end each day, pointing an antenna, and then recording your position and taking a bearing and all that kind of stuff and triangulating where the critter is. Now, um, uh, just about everything is GPS-based, uh, either real-time GPS or, or package data that, that uses a cell phone network or something of that nature. To, uh, to send up a, a, a data a couple times a day, for example, to save battery life. Here's some images of some of the relocations. Um, as I mentioned before, these guys cut off the antlers for safety for the critters, um, and they, they transport them. They sometimes will transport them in the air, but more typically, in our case, in California, we're typically moving them via vehicles like, like, uh, like this individual. 
Um, uh, okay, so, so now we're starting to get into the area, or the, the issue of uh, too much success, at least hyper-locally, right? So again, we know we're, we're nowhere close to the half a million individuals we, we historically were, but nevertheless, we're never going to be able to support a half million you know, elk in California ever again. There's just too many people and too much agriculture and that kind of stuff. But these small pockets are starting to get uh, filled, right? And so, so these critters, once they get filled, now they start to go somewhere else. And so we, we increasingly are seeing things like, you know, um, uh, letters to the editor, people saying there's too many elk, we got to do something. So, um, so I'll tell you guys the story and then I want you to, and then I want you guys to all do a little bit of Googling here when we pause and I want you guys to tell me what, what the most current controversies you find regarding elk uh, in California. But I'll just tell you the quick story before we go into these, these current uh, existing management challenges going forward. And that is the story of, um, over the break, I, I played that little quick video for you guys of um, uh, uh, Point Reyes National Seashore uh, and the elk that are there. So this is, um, so the elk there were, are on a little peninsula. So relatively isolated from people, et cetera. A lot of historic um, uh, cattle ranching that has gone on there. And again, as most of those nature documentaries talk about, they say the cattle ranching has been going on here for generations. They don't say there used to be tule elk here that we killed and then replaced them with cattle. We don't say that, but that's fine. Um, uh, and then also, uh, you know, residents and, and, and homes around the area, right? And it's a national recreation area, similar to our um, similar to our uh, Santa Monica National Recreation Area, in that it's. It's the, the, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area is made up of several uh, disjunct parcels that make up the total unit. But in this case, we're talking about this area around Tamales Bay, which is, which is um, uh, uh, north of San Francisco, Marin County area, like, you know, north, north of, the, of the Golden Gate Bridge kind of thing. And so here, we started, we, we, had, we, we introduced Tule Elk, and one, one of the recovery populations. And they did, they've done really well. And they've grown, and they've grown, and they've grown. But now they've gotten so big that they have started to, uh, you know, started to um, uh, uh, cause some issues, right? So some of the issues, some of the wildlife human conflicts with the tule out there include things like um, uh, walking on the road where people are driving in and then people have to stop and they can't drive because they don't want to drive into a tule elk, right? So they're disrupting some of the flow there. They've pushed down fences. We have to have much more, we have to spend a lot more money on really, really robust fences. This is not a deer fence or a coyote fence, right? This is something that a big, many hundred pound animal can shove up against and it won't knock the fence post over, right? So that's a, that's a much more, that's a much larger investment in terms of resources, et cetera. Um, uh, and then we started having tule elk get, so it turned out the population got so big that we saturated the peninsula, and then people didn't really understand this, but tule elk can swim. So the tule elk started swimming across the bay sometimes and showing up on the other side, and then people were like, what? You know, so we thought we had this natural peninsula, this sort of, so only like you know, a fence on the, on the you know, if you imagine your thumb, only a fence at the bottom where your thumb joined your hand. But now we found, oh my gosh, they can go from my, my, the tip of my thumb to the tip of my index finger kind of thing, right? So, oh my gosh, okay, so what do we do? So then the National Park Service, which manages this area, um, comes up with a plan. This is, this is starting about 20 years ago now. Comes up with a plan and says, hey, we're going to cull the herd. What is culling? Culling is hunting. Uh, and then suddenly, the, the community in Marin County got really PO'd. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. And so the plan was to sustainably manage this elk population by generating money from the hunting, from the removal of the animals, as we've talked about, right? The hunting tags. Essentially, there's such public uproar and how dare you, how dare you hunt anything. Again, we've lost hunters in our society, so that voice is very weak, especially in a place like Marin County. Um, where almost nobody hunts, right? So, so the hunters don't have a good representation, and there's a very strong um, uh, animal rights uh, 
a, a, a lobby a, a, a voice in the community. So long story short, we shut down the, the plan to hunt. The plan to hunt would have been either revenue neutral or very close to revenue neutral, right? So we would have generated the money that we need to help manage this population, deal with fences and everything uh, going forward. Now we lose all the revenue that we would have gotten from hunting. And the population is continuing to grow. So the, the solution is, anybody want to guess what the solution was that people proposed? The population's growing. We, they can't keep growing. Everybody, everybody realizes if they keep growing, they're going to strip the um, strip the grass and everything. What's that? Relocation. Oh, okay. So relocation takes a long time because of because of all these because of all these constraints. Yes, relocation is an ideal thing, but it's hard. So we can't just relocate some guys tomorrow. And, the, and there's more babies every year. So we can't kill the babies. So how, how are we going to deal with that? Not euthanize. They're not allowed to. So close. Birth control. So the decision was to use essentially Depro Provera, basically, like a long-term, a long-term, uh, uh, long-acting um, pill, basically, right? Except we need to get to all these guys, so we need to get, give it to them from a helicopter with a dart gun. So we've gone, from, we've gone from revenue neutral to hunt a few individuals each year to now we can't hunt anybody, and now the program costs millions and millions of dollars a year to give these individuals birth control. And it works for a season or so, but you can't, you, you have to re-treat, you have to reapply, right? It's not like a lifelong, like, you know, dart, dart a female and she doesn't have babies ever again, right? You have to reapply. So, so the question is, so the question is, uh, have birth control, so, so um, yeah, so we know that birth control does work on, on these individuals um, because they're basically a, a placental mammal, right? So, so they're, they're, they're hormones that regulate uh, ovulation and stuff is, we, we understand, yeah, it's very similar. So, so um, it's, it's, it's similar in, in all of we mammals, right? And, and not exactly, I mean, there, there's differences, but, but it's close enough that, that um, it can work. It's just expensive, it's just expensive. Kind of, kind of, yeah. There's still, still, we still have problems, still have issues. Um, but, but the point is, um, uh, because we lost the voice of the hunters in that community, we now are resorting to things like, um, uh, or, or it's, it's, considered, it's considered realistic to do, do um, at least considered by many realistic, to do birth control as, as an option of a wild population. So where we are now is uh, the main challenges here are depredation related concerns. And depredation is that term you'll remember from mountain lions. This is, so, so you can only hunt, or you can only kill a tule elk in tule elk, in tule elk season with a tule elk hunting permit, right? Unless they're a nuisance, just like, just like a mountain lion. So if they're a nuisance, you can get what's known as a depredation permit. You can't get this, but the state can issue it. And it's usually not to you. It's usually issued to, uh, I mean, if, if the animal was charging you and you had a gun, you shot it, they would issue you a depredation permit after the fact. But, but normally it's, hey, there's a nuisance animal and it's causing all these problems and it keeps causing. So then they would issue a depredation permit and either a, a state authority or a contractor for the state would do the actual depredating, would do the actual killing. That most of, those, most of those requests for depreda depredation today come from fence damage. And so the idea is the tule elk damages the fence. And then, and then it's not so much that they're worried about the tule elk, I and mean, they kind of are. But the bigger concern is that their livestock gets out. So then their sheep start run, run around or, or whatever, you know, get out and, and get loose. Uh, or the tule elk just tramples crops. Either they might eat some of them, but they also just trample them, and that, that's a loss of things like corn and things like that. 
Uh, the big challenge with relocation efforts, so Max over, over there suggests, hey, why don't we just relocate them? It ain't easy. And it, it takes a long time, as in years and years and years, to get a new site approved for relocation. So we'd love to relocate them to more sites, but given all of those constraints that we have to meet, almost all of those are violated by, most of the, by many of the re remaining relocation sites, right? Either they're, they're near another population of elk, or uh, they're too close to people, or it, you know, what, whatever, whatever the, the deal is. It's, it's very hard to find a place where humans aren't that meet all those things. Um, and going forward, the relocation costs are, as everything else, is only going up, right? Labor is only going up. It's only getting more expensive, getting more expensive, getting more expensive. So relocation efforts are still ongoing, but they're non-trivial. It's not an on-demand kind of thing. Um, They, they, yeah, well, hunting does provide the money for it. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Additional. Yeah, yeah. Um, another challenge is, is how do we, if we aren't going to have a whole lot more potential new chunks of space opening up, <clears throat> that's going to mean we need to keep, you know, doing better with the individuals we do have, right? And so, um, and so I'll, I'll just say that with this effort, the relocation enhancement, I tried to establish a Thule elk population on one of, so the, one of my main charges before I moved down here to help start this university was to manage this grassland up at Stanford and um, that was mostly, a, mostly grazed by cattle. And so we were seriously trying to figure out if we could bring Thule elk to our grassland it has, it, it was right next to the 280 freeway in the, on the San Francisco Peninsula, which is a very, very major heavy traffic freeway, like the 101. Because of that, a really, really robust fence existed on that, on that, uh, by, on a huge length, like a couple miles worth of the property. So we already had the starter of a really, really good fence. We just have to add in some other fence. But even this, that other parts would have cost millions of dollars um, to, stop, to put the fence in, right? Uh, I, I would say uh, Stanford is pretty wealthy. That, that, that was not a deal killer. But the state of California, after many meetings, said, we're not going to let you have any Tulio. It's like, why? It's like, this is their historic range. We have all the stuff. We can, you know, we can you know, guarantee there's water there. And they said, oh, no, you know, uh, it's, it's not natural. Like, it, like, they can't roam freely. They can't, in other words, they couldn't roam off. This is basically near Palo Alto, right? We, they couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't, we'd have fences so they couldn't go into town, right? Which seems to make sense from a conservation standpoint. Here's a grassland. Let's get this old grazer on this grassland. But their rules were, hey, from here, here forward, we, these guys need to be free roaming, right? wide ranging. And so that doesn't count. It was like, are you kidding me? Right, really? We wouldn't want to have another, you know, 150 animals in the state, in the state? It, doesn't that make sense? Um, in particular, it's such a popular freeway, it would have been great because everybody and their brother would see them when they're commuting back and forth. So it would be a wonderful education opportunity too. But they're like, yeah, no, mm -mm, fenced in. Mm -mm. And during some years, you would definitely have to give them water, which we were fine with because we already had that infrastructure for the cattle. But they said, no, it has to be like naturally occurring water source. And so, it was, so it's like, so stuff like that make enhancement a real challenge, right? Because even, it, it just the constraints are, are crazy. Okay, and then the last one, as with so many of our, of our conservation challenges these days, it's the problem of the imperfect information, right? There's just so much more we'd like to know. You guys were asking questions about how well the, the depo how well the um, birth control works, and and you know we didn't know that they can swim, and you know, all these various things, right? So so we don't know a lot about them uh, as much. Well, I should, let me say that we know we know a good amount about them. We don't know as much as we'd like to know, particularly in this era of a changing climate. How are our tule elk going to respond in these drier times? How are they going to respond when we have these massive atmospheric rivers that just come storm after storm after storm after storm, right? I mean, they're probably going to be okay, but 
but that's really, you know, trying to model the population, that's really key, right? Understanding what this changing weather is going to do to them. And we don't necessarily know that. And so, so that is a, uh, that's a challenge going forward. Um, and, and in particular, um, not just how the tule elk are going to respond to climate change, but how their, the, their habitats are going to respond. Um, you know, can they use alternative vegetation and things like that? We're just not, not sure of. So these are, see the, these are all uh, the challenges we're facing right now with this, again, what I consider a conservation success. Even though I couldn't, they wouldn't let me have my own population, kind of PO'd about that, right? Angry about that. Yeah, I'm all angry. Um, but, but still, but still, uh, the state, I would argue, has done a great job, right? This has all happened outside of all the legal and entanglements and people angry with each other and people electing different people to office because they can't stand the Endangered Species Act because they want to save the Endangered Species Act, right? This is, you know, we should have more elk than we have now, but we have elk. And we've done it mostly, mostly out of the controversy and out of the anger of much of our society. So this is nothing like the polarization that has happened with other endangered species. So I would, ar I would argue that, is, that in and of itself is a success um, of what's going on. Yeah, Caleb. Totally. Uh, all good questions. Happy to talk about it. But just to wrap up this, uh, this tule elk thing. So, so you guys can all see tule elk. So if you've not seen tule elk, uh, I really want to encourage you guys to go see them. Um, uh, it's just about an hour drive from here, right? It's just 126. 126 to the five, five to the bottom of the grapevine, and you're basically there. So it's about an hour, hour and 10 minute drive or so. So for the grand scheme of things, to see one of these crazy awesome animals, it's very close. Um, and so this is the State Thule uh, Elk Reserve at Button Willow. And if you just put Button Willow in your Google Maps you, or State Thule Elk Reserve, you can get to it. And this is what it looks like on the five when you're driving towards it and you take the exit. And then uh, right here, is one of the, oh, that's my son, look at that, that's funny, when he was a lot younger. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is an overview, and so it's like a little like, uh, like a raised platform kind of thing. And so here are all these tule elk hanging out, and, uh, and this is what they look like, and they're just hanging out grazing. So sometimes if, if they're like laying down or kind of over behind this tree or something, it might, might be a little bit hard to see, but, but most days you can see them pretty well. Um, so I'd encourage you guys to go see this uh, great part of your heritage, this great conservation success story. Imperfect though it might be, it's still a success. And, uh, and, a, and an example of species-based management outside, species-based recovery of a rare animal outside of the Endangered Species Act. So then just to summarize what we talked about today, we have three elks, uh, three elks in California, two different species. We focus on the tule elk for our conversation here, which is the smallest one and is the one that prefers the most open space, more, more grasslandy type type environments. I, I, I didn't. Uh, we played the some of the calls, some of the bugling on YouTube, but suffice it to say that that they're they're they don't sound like I I, I would think a big giant animal would sound like. Um, their antlers are often iconic, and they figure prominently in management. That's what hunters want for their trophy walls. That's what that's what we use for the symbol for the program and that kind of stuff. Um, and we mentioned that antlers are not horns and antlers are seasonal. Um, and, uh, and before, they were widespread, about a half, half a million um, in the state, around 1500, so before the gold rush. And then somewhere less than about 12, we don't know the exact number, the lore is two, but it was clearly more than two. But, but so we went from uh, you know, that number down to a handful in 1874, and now we're back up to on the order of about 6,000-ish individuals um, as, of, as of this year in the state of California. Um, uh, we have a long management history with this, with this particular organism. We have lots of uh, different guidance starting in 1852, um, which is one of our oldest uh, 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 biological uh, management um, policies in uh, the state of California. Uh, we ban hunting in 73. We have the first successful translocation in 1914 from one geographic location to another. 
Um, it's not in any of the ES, either the federal or state ESAs. Um, and we started re-hunting again in the late 80s. And now, as you saw, we have uh, anywhere from you know, 150 to 100 and, you know, 200 odd um, uh, tags uh, or opportunities to hunt a tule elk issued each year. The sale of those hunting tags generates revenue for their ongoing management and stewardship. And, uh, and this is an alternative to the ESA approach.